Our Father, we're grateful for your provision and for your, for your mercy and grace to us. And I pray, Lord, that this morning you'll make that more real to us in our lives. We, we thank you for, for your word. I pray that you'll help me as I preach your word to do so in the power of your Holy Spirit. Open our hearts and our minds to it. Shut out all other things. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Years ago, I was checking out at Walmart. A wonderful experience. Uh, it surprises me more and more every time I check out at Walmart uh, how much it costs. But uh, just, I guess it depends on how hungry I am when I'm going through the aisles. But uh, here I was checking out, and my attention was drawn to a little boy who was standing at the end of the checkout aisle where the, where the bags are. And apparently he had disagreed with something. And he was standing there and stamping his foot and saying, It's not fair! It's not fair! I'm not doing it justice. He was screaming at the top of his lungs and crying and blubbering. And a little boy about maybe four years old. I did not have any children at the time. And so uh, I knew immediately that when I had children, they would never misbehave in public. I knew that as... A pre-parent, I knew that that was going to be the case. Apparently, this young man was so upset because his mother didn't purchase something for him that he believed he deserved to have or should have been given. Um, so he let everybody within earshot know that he had gotten a raw deal. And he wanted everybody to know that his mom was not fair. Now, we would not stand in public and scream, it's not fair. I don't think so, anyway. Uh, would we? Probably not. Okay. We're more concerned than a four-year-old is about what everybody else thinks of us. And so we, we kind of carefully guard that reputation. But even if we wouldn't scream it out loud, do we ever whisper it in our hearts? It's not fair. There are plenty of instances in life that you might be tempted to think and to believe that it's not fair. And what's not fair? Well, you go to church and, and you try to live for the Lord. You're not perfect, but uh, you, you do your best to live for the Lord. Uh, you ask Him for forgiveness when you fall short. And there are other people who live their lives, and you know them, and they live their lives with no regard for God or anybody else, and they, they have a bigger house better health report, and, uh, and seem to have more respect than you do. It's not fair. Maybe you carry a huge burden that others do not carry. It could be a financial burden. It could be a physical burden. It could be a family problem or some personal failure. Hey, every few years there's a class reunion, you know, most people's high schools do that. And you go back to high school, and there's that kid that didn't study, that flunked everything, was a goof-off, and now he's rich. There's one in every class, and it's not me. I just did half of that bargain. But uh, anyway, there's, there seems to be one in every class that you, he was probably voted most likely to fail, and he succeeded big time. It's not fair. There's something that you want or something you've always wanted to have. It isn't something sinful and most other people have it, but, but you lack it. It's not fair, you whisper in your heart. And as your heart whispers, it's not fair, what you're really saying is, God's not fair. You're saying, God, if you were fair, then this need that I have would be met. Or this pain that I feel would be dulled. Or something to that nature. But you're saying God is not fair. Do we serve a fair God? Does He treat you right? Does He do right by you and your loved ones? Is He fair? These types of questions were uh, most likely on the hearts of the disciples when Peter said to Jesus... We've forsaken all, everything, and followed you. What do we have there for? It was a legitimate question, and Jesus treated it as such. But Peter's question was a response to uh, what him and the, and the twelve disciples observed going on around them. 
Uh, they had left their whole lives. Everything. They followed Jesus. Literally. Now other people at the time were followers of Jesus. They had, they had given up some. They had given up this and that. And they had trusted in Christ as their Messiah and their Savior. But they didn't lose their houses or their jobs or their families or many other things that the disciples had left behind. I mean, Mary and Martha and Lazarus lived in Bethany and they were well off. Whenever Jesus went to Bethany, they stayed there because they had the money and the means to feed them. Uh, and and uh, so yet they, they had all this wealth and they, they had a nice income. They were well esteemed in their community. I mean, when Lazarus died and then Jesus brought him back from the dead, there was tons of people there mourning him because he was a, a pillar. He was well respected. There was a man named Nicodemus who came to Jesus by night. He was a Pharisee. And he didn't lose all when he followed Jesus. There was a man named Joseph of Arimathea. He was wealthy, so wealthy that when, when uh, Jesus died, Joseph had enough influence with Pilate to get the body of Jesus and put him in his own tomb. He, was a, he owned it. They didn't lose all that the disciples lost. When the rich young man came to Jesus and said, what must I do to have eternal life? Eventually that boiled down to Jesus saying, forsake all and follow me. The man refused and that's when Peter came and said, we've left everything. What do we have? What Peter was really saying is, our reward ought to be the greatest reward because we have given up more and done more work and suffered more than anybody else that is following you, Lord. By the way, that was true. And so he says, we ought to be first on payday. On reward day, we ought to be first. It would only be fair, right? Jesus responded to this attitude with a parable. Jesus was so good at telling stories. Uh, uh, the brothers Grimm had nothing on him. That rhymed, by the way. I just made that up off the top of my head. But he responded to this parable, to this attitude with a parable. As we explore the story Jesus told, we are going to see that God, for the most part, is not fair. All right? Do we serve a, God, uh, a fair God? No. God is not fair. He's not fair in this parable. He's not fair in life. And, and so what do we do when God's not fair? That's what this story explores. What do we do when, um, or how should a believer respond to the fact that God is not fair, especially when it seems that He's not fair to you or to your loved ones? So Jesus tells this story about a wealthy landowner who hired a bunch of laborers to go work in his field. And this story will help us understand what we should do when we perceive that God is not fair to us or someone we love. So we find this story in Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter 19. And I'm not even there. Oh my goodness. Okay. Uh, Matthew chapter 19. And uh, we'll read. We'll start in verse... Uh, 30 and read on through chapter 20 and verse 16. All right, Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 30. But many that are first shall be last, and the last shall be first. For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, they, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. And again he went out about the sixth and the ninth hour and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour he went out and found others standing idle and saith unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right that ye shall ye receive. So when even was come, the Lord of the vineyard said to his steward, Call all the laborers and give them their hire, beginning with the last unto the first. And when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. But when the first came, they supposed that they should have received more, and they likewise received every man a penny. And when they had received it, they murmured against the good men of the house, saying, These last have 
wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not thou agree with me for a penny? Take that thine is, and go thy way. I will give unto this last, even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own? Is thine eye evil because I am good? So the last shall be first, and the first last for many are called, but few are chosen. What must we do? What should be our reaction when God is not fair? When God is not fair, we must trust that He is right. Because to be fair and to be right are not the same thing. But we can know, if we know anything about God, it is that He is right. And sometimes in our experience, it seems that God is wrong because we look and we see that He's not fair. And in, in our American mindset, the only thing that's right is what is fair. But God is not always fair, but we know He's always right, so when He's not fair, we should trust that He's right. Jesus told a story. It's pretty easy to see that the wealthy landowner here in his story is not fair. I mean, that's what he's charged with, and that's true. He's not fair. The landowner goes to the market about 6 o'clock in the morning um, and hires laborers to work in his field. This was common. Many workers... In, in that time, even today, are, are unskilled labor, and they would go to the marketplace and wait to be hired for the day. They didn't have a, a steady every you know, monthly or weekly job or a yearly job. They just went down to the market. Hopefully someone would hire them. During certain times of the year, especially harvest, a wealthy landowner such as this man would go to the marketplace because he needed extra help. He probably had hired hands that he had year-round working for him, but during harvest and planting season, uh, they would need a lot extra to, to get it all done in time. And so he goes early in the morning, 6 o'clock in the morning, and the landowner and, and, and some workers that were already there in the marketplace, they reached an agreement. These men would work all day for a penny or for a denarius. Apparently, there was much to do because on the third hour, three hours later, that would be 9 o'clock in the morning, the landowner went back to the marketplace and hired some more men. Instead of a specific contract, he told them, you go work for the day and I will pay you whatever is right. And he would do right by them if they would work for him. The third hour of the Jewish day was 9 o'clock a.m. They started their day at 6 o'clock at a 12-hour day. Uh, I mean, obviously they had 24 hours to live in the day, but this is how they kept time. Uh, at 6 o'clock was the first hour in, in the morning, and 6 o'clock in the evening was even. That was last hour, so they went from 6 to 6 on a 12-hour day. So the third hour is 9 o'clock in the morning. Later on at noon, that's the sixth hour, the landowner goes out and hires more men. Then again at 3 o'clock p.m., the ninth hour, he goes out and still hires more men using the same uh, method to a, of agreement, whatever's right, I will pay you. Finally, at 5 o'clock p.m., the 11th hour, uh, an hour before quitting time, uh, he goes out and he hires more workers in the marketplace, and we get a little bit more detail about his conversation with these last men. Jesus uh, gives us that. Uh, he, he asks them, why are you still here all day long, standing idle? He's not asking them, why are you so lazy, you're not working? He says, why, why aren't you, has nobody hired you? They said, no, no one's hired us. We're willing to work, no one's hired us. And uh, so the, the landowner hired them and agreed to pay them whatever is right. Whatever is right. It says that in verse 7. It says, I will do right by you. And they go out on that agreement to work. So, even comes, 6 p.m., quitting time. And uh, that was the official end of the Jewish work day. So the landowner told his foreman, the uh, uh, steward here, uh, he says, go call all the workers, bring them in, and pay them. And that was according to Old Testament law. You were not allowed to keep the wages of someone who worked for you till the next day. You had to pay them that day. They didn't, wouldn't that be nice, every day's payday? <laughs> 
I don't know how that would work out with taxes, though. But uh, every day was payday. So uh, the landowner uh, in, gives him special instructions, though. This wouldn't happen normally. But he says, pay the ones that I hired last. Pay them first and work your way to uh, the men I hired first. And when the last hired men were paid, the guys that had worked for one hour, they each received one denarius. Now, I can imagine back in the back of the line, the first hired men began to recalculate their wages. If these guys only worked one hour and they get one denarius, one penny, and what are we going to do? What are we going to get for a 12-hour shift? So they recalibrated their expectations accordingly. And they supposed that they were worth much more than one denarius now. But then they get to the front of the line, and they're paid only one. No more than the rest of the men who worked less or even one hour. At this point, they begin to complain. Now, be honest. Wouldn't you? They gathered together and appointed a spokesman to bring their complaint to the landowner. They, um, in, in verse 13, it says, but he answered one of them. So this, this landowner is having a conversation with one man. They maybe formed a quick union or something like that. And this is the steward, the union steward. I don't know. But uh, they sent one man to the landowner to bring their complaint. And what's their complaint? We worked 12 hours and they only worked one hour. You paid them the same as us. It's not fair. You've not been fair to us, sir. But then the landowner defends himself. If we look uh, at verse 13, but he answered one of them and said, Friend, I do thee no wrong. Didst not, didst not thou agree with me for a penny? He says, I've, I've, I've not done wrong by you. I fulfilled your contract. We agreed. You're going to work one day for one penny or one denarius. A penny sounds pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> uh, in, in our, oh, who, how many of you would work all day for a penny? Not, not me. Uh, but a denarius was a lot of money. Um, he says, I've not done you wrong. I've fulfilled your contract. He says, I've not done wrong by you in fulfilling your contract. After I did that, uh, I can do whatever I want with my own money. It's not your money. It's my money. And, and I, it's none of your business. I can do what I want with my money after I pay you. I've, I've not done you wrong. He says, I've not done you wrong by being generous to other people. Verse 15, he says, is thine eye evil because I am good? Uh, good meaning good and generous to other people. And so he says, I've not done you anything wrong. You know what? The landowner was not fair, but he was right. He paid those first hired men exactly what he said he would pay them. He did not cheat them. They were perfectly content to work one day for one denarius. By the way, one denarius was the pay of a Roman soldier. And it was good pay. It was much more than any unskilled laborer could, be, could, could expect to make for a day's labor. Much more. And so when the landowner at 6 o'clock in the morning offered them that, they were, they were amazed. And so he had the right to do whatever he wanted with his money. He was right, but he was not fair, was he? In that way, in, in what way was he uh, not fair in paying his laborers? Was it unfair for him to pay men who worked one hour a whole denarius while paying men who worked 12 hours the same? Is that unfair? That's what they supposed. But who's really getting ripped off here? The landowner. He's, he's taking a bath here. He is, he is getting ripped off. The pay scale was not really uh, something that was advantageous towards him. And the pay scale was not where he was unfair. Uh, he got the raw deal because um, hiring these guys for a denarius a day would be like hiring a teenager to rake your lawn and then paying him 500 bucks. All right? Uh, I mean, it's just, they're not worth that much money, all right, that, to, to this unskilled labor. And so at 6 o'clock in the morning, 
by the dawn's early light, they make this agree. This guy says, I'll give you a denarius a day. And these workers look at each other and they can't believe it. They look at each other and say, what's the catch? Where's this guy been all our lives, right? And so they're excited. I mean, they, they're, they're going off to work singing, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. You know, they're, they're whistling while they work. And, uh, and, and uh, they, they can't believe their good fortune. They worked happily all day long knowing that they were going to get one denarius. They were thrilled. Nobody had ever paid them like that before. If the landowner was fair, he would have never agreed with them for that payment in the first place. But he was not fair. He was right. They knew all day long what they were going to get. But then they started looking around at the other workers. They all got paid the same. And when they saw it, their contentment and their thrill and their joy vanished. Why? Because they supposed something. If you look in verse 10, what did they suppose? They supposed they would get more. Why did they suppose they would get more? They supposed that because they supposed they were worth more. Even though they received far they, they would receive far more than they deserved, they complained. Now this parable is not a good pattern for business now. Don't go out if you own if you ever own a business, don't go out and hire a bunch of people and pay the guys who work one hour the same as the guys who work 12 hours. It's probably not a good idea, but that's okay because this is not intended to be a business model. If you go back to verse 1, it says, for the kingdom of heaven is like this. All right? And so in the kingdom of heaven, many who thought they would be first would be last, and many who thought they were last will be first. That's the point of the whole parable. The workers who complained thought that they were worth more. In other words, first, they thought they were worth more than the other workers, not realizing that they weren't even worth what they were getting. I mean, if they were such good workers, why did he have to keep going out and hiring more? I mean, if they were so awesome, he shouldn't have to go out and hire all the, that other crew. They should have got the job done. Peter and the other apostles thought themselves to be worthy of their reward. I mean, they really did bear the heat of the day. But even though they gave up everything to follow Christ, they did not earn heaven by what they lost. Whatever you lose to follow Christ is earning nothing. It's just a consequence. What Christ gave them, He gave them by grace, not by deserved merit. So when God is not fair, what should we do? Well, obviously, we should trust that He is right. We must rejoice in the fact that God is right and not fair. In what ways should we rejoice? How do we rejoice in God not being fair? Well, first of all, rejoice when God does right by you. Rejoice when, when God does something right for somebody. He does right by you. Um, here in, in uh, verse 2, when he had agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, he sent them to his vineyard. He was doing a lot right by them. And then in verse 10, when they first came, they supposed they should have received more. They received likewise every man a penny. We go to verse 14. He says to them, take that thine is and go thy way. In verse 13, he says, I do thee no wrong. What they didn't realize is he had done them a lot of right. And he had taken a huge loss to hire them at that price. You know what we ought to do is we ought to rejoice when God does right by us. Praise God for your penny. You know that? Praise God for your penny. Remember how thrilled you were when God saved you? You remember that when, when you realized you were a sinner and by faith and through grace you, you came uh, to, to Christ, the Holy Spirit was working on your heart and you, you, the thrill of escaping the damnation of hell was just, that was enough at the time. The joy of knowing that heaven would forever be your home, that you could pillow your head every night for the rest of your life knowing that if you didn't wake up, it was okay. The wonder that the God who created this universe with all of its 
vast wonder and, and gigantic, enormous expanse would love one small speck on that universe, and that speck is you. The beauty of the fact that God hears the prayers coming from that little speck. Remember the joy and the thrill when you were first saved? I mean, it was just it. That was enough. God did right by you, didn't He? Was He fair when He did that? No. Don't pine away for what is fair when we deserve death in hell for sinning against a holy and righteous God. He sent His Son, Jesus Christ, to die in our place. That was not fair. But God commendeth His love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And I tell you this, when I got saved, I didn't stop deserving death in hell. I still deserve it now, but because God is not fair and God has done right by me, I am a child of God. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God. Even to who? Even to those who believe on His name. God has done right by us. Let's rejoice in that instead of, instead of uh, complaining about what is seemingly not fair. In this old fallen and sinful world, we encounter many difficulties, many trials, much pain, don't we? We do. We bear the heat and the burden of the day. We experience pain and sorrow and regret and depression and disappointment. Other people do us wrong and they get away with it sometimes. Circumstances may seem upside down, but God has done right by you and God has done right by me and I want to rejoice and never lose the joy of my salvation because it wasn't fair. You can rejoice if you trust God to be right when He's not fair. Rejoice when God does right by you. What else should we rejoice in? Rejoice when God does right by others. Many people, when God blesses somebody else, they get mad. That should never be the attitude of a Christian. If you take the person that you dislike most in the world, and if God blesses them, you should rejoice. Rejoice when God does right by others. Don't ever look at someone else and wish they had less blessings, even if that person despises you. You can go to the biggest and nicest house in Mawikwa. Some of you from Decatur, you could throw in Decatur with that. And there are some big and nice houses in Mawikwa and Decatur. Uh, see, we were, went on a bike ride a year or two ago, right? And we were going through this neighborhood, and every house was like bigger than Mawikwa. Like you could put all of Mawikwa in this. I mean, there was huge houses, gated facilities. Um, and I was afraid to be seen out there um, because I would, they would look at me as, and say, what are you doing here? <laughs> uh, you know, let me ask you this. If you burn that house down, is your house going to get bigger? You tear that thing, you spray paint graffiti all over, uh, you spray paint 1% versus 99 all over that, and is that going to change your situation for the better? Probably for the worse if you get caught, but... Uh, is that going to help you at all? No. Neither will it make your life better by begrudging another person for the blessings that God has given them. Your being mad at them is not going to make your blessings any better. In fact, what's going to happen is your blessings are going to seem to get smaller. God asks the question, or the, the landowner asks him the question in verse 14. He says... Uh, Take that thine is. Go thy way. I, I will give to this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with my own? He's saying, I'm, see, I'm, I'm the boss. And uh, what I do with my money is none of your business. But he, he says, ends it up with this. Is thine eye evil because I am good? He says, do you begrudge my generosity? These men were mad at the landowner because he was good to their fellow workers. What caused them to complain? Did they complain because they were cheated? No. The landowner said, take what's yours and go. That's what they agreed to. They were thrilled about that earlier. Rather, they complained when they looked 
at what everybody else was getting. And then they thought, these people are getting better than what they deserve. They shouldn't get that. Wow. That wasn't fair, was it? What is it about human nature? What is it about us that causes us to be upset when we think someone has it better than they deserve? See those millionaires or something like that and think, they don't deserve all that. This attitude shows up in some of the things we think and say. For example, well, he may have the perfect family, but I bet when nobody's looking, it all falls apart. Oh, she looks 10 years younger than her age, but pretty soon it's all going to fall apart for her. You just wait. He may have got the promotion, but I'll bet the boss is going to regret that. It's all downhill from here for them. That's human nature. To look for a chink in the armor, to speculate about the possibility that the other person may not have it so good, or to complain when such a possibility doesn't seem possible. Why? Because we're comparing them to us. And let's face it, we're not objective. That's what the comparing workers were doing. They couldn't see how good they had it while they were so mad about how good everybody else had it. The 12 apostles lost sight of how good they had it too. They, they had got together, they appointed a spokesman, Peter, to speak to the Lord about it. Isn't it interesting that if the complaining workers got together in Jesus' story, this is a fictional story, uh, and, and uh, appointed one spokesman to tell the landowner that he wasn't fair. Doesn't that sound a whole lot about a, like a, a group of 12 guys that Jesus was just dealing with who got together and appointed Peter as their spokesman? It was, Jesus was subtle, but he was clear too. So I'm speaking to you guys. And so we ought to rejoice and be happy for others that they are experiencing God's blessing, even if it seems like their blessing is 12 times more than ours. But it's not too hard. Uh, um, it's not too hard to, to rejoice when someone you love is experiencing God's blessing. Usually that's not bad, not hard. But what about if it's someone you don't like so much? Someone who told you off yesterday. Rejoice. God is good. God is right. But God is not fair. When God is not fair, trust Him. Trust that He's always right. Have you been tempted to complain about things in your life. Maybe you've been faced with some really big disappointment, something you really wanted and it crashed. It didn't come through. It didn't happen the way. You, maybe you prayed about it. You, you, you sought counsel. You sought help on it. Maybe, maybe it was something you were working towards. You worked so hard and it just didn't work out. It, di it didn't happen. And your heart whispers, it's not fair. You carry a huge burden that others don't seem to bear. A physical, a financial, a spiritual, a, a family problem, a personal failure, something you can't do anything about and your heart whispers, it's not fair. There's something you want, maybe something you've always wanted and you can't have. and It's something a lot of people have. Maybe not even a bad thing. and Your heart whispers, it's not fair. Don't stand at the end of the checkout line of life stamping your foot, screaming at the top of your lungs. It's not fair because you will look every bit as ridiculous as a four-year-old boy. Rather rejoice. God is not fair, but He is right. And in the past, He's done right by you and by me. And in the future, He will always do right by you and by me. And let's rejoice in that. Let's pray.